Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Job, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright and a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding, holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. So in our scripture for today, we find the familiar story of Job. But perhaps if you're not familiar with the story of Job, let me give you a brief overview of what befalls him. Job was a good, God-fearing person, perhaps one of the most pious people to ever live. You see, God even looks upon him and says, look at this blameless servant. But then Satan steps in and says, I can turn him and he will not be blameless. I will make him curse you to your face. Satan asserts that Job is only pious because God has favored him. And if God stops favoring him, then surely he will turn and curse God. Now God believes that Job will stand up to anything that is thrown at him. And he allows Satan to do his worst, telling him, you can do whatever, but you cannot kill him. Now when we take a second and we think about this scripture, it is really easy for us to say something like, I don't like this. I don't like what's happening here, and I don't like what it feels like God is doing here. See, if God is willing to let Satan torture Job, who was such a blameless person, what is he willing to allow Satan to do to me? Well, you need to understand that is not what the story of Job is about. It is not about what God is willing to let Satan do. It is a story about how someone can suffer through so much and still find love for God. And boy, does Job suffer. These are the things that befall Job. The Sabaeans took his oxen and donkeys and killed all of his servants that were with them. Fire from heaven burned up his sheep and his servants that were with the sheep. The Chaldeans took Job's camels and killed all his servants that were with them. And then a great wind came and killed all of Job's children, causing the collapse of his oldest son's house while they were eating and drinking together. He goes through all of that and he still does not curse God. So God says to Satan, look, you have taken all from him and he still holds on to his integrity. Satan replies, well, yes, but let me afflict his body. Surely if he has to suffer physically, then he will turn on you. 
So then Job is covered with sores from head to toe after all these other things. And he takes a piece of broken pottery, breaks the sores open for relief, and sits among the ashes. Things are so bad for him that his wife even comes to him and says, are you still going to tell me that you are faithful to God? You need to just curse him so that you can die and be rid of all this pain. And his response is really unbelievable to us. What do you mean I should curse God? Should we only take the good that God gives us and never accept that there will be any bad? Now to our modern sensibility, that seems so strange. We always want things to go well for us, right? And we think that if we live our lives in the ways that Jesus calls us to do, we're only ever going to have good things happen to us. Brothers and sisters, that is simply not the truth. You see, this world is still a broken world. And this world is still full of sin. And as hard as it is to say, bad things do happen to good people. Now, I know that doesn't seem fair to us. However, as I've heard a million times in my life, and I'm sure you have as well, life is not fair. So with all of that darkness, where does that leave us? What does it mean for Job, and what does it tell us about God? Well, first, let's talk about what it tells us about God. See, it's important in this, when we read and study Job that we remember this key lesson. It is not God that is causing the afflictions that are befalling Job. It is Satan who is causing those afflictions to befall Job. So God is not there handing out these punishments to Job. You see, we are God's children, and he does love us, and he takes great pride in us. However, he will allow us to be tested. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where God was testing you? You can clearly see the bounds of what is right and what is wrong and know what you should be doing. You know, we do this as parents sometimes as well. Whether we mean to test our children or not, we do things so that we have the opportunity to teach them. And we do test them so that when they make the right choices, we can praise them. One of the things that I have found myself doing with my kids involves giving them money to go buy something. I like to go to the local sports teams' games, and honestly, it doesn't particularly matter what sport it is, I just like to go watch the games. And often I'll take a few of the kids with me to the games. And now, if you've ever taken a child to like a football game, you'll know that if there's a snack bar that is open at one of those games, your kids are going to notice that right away. I swear it's like we get out of the car in the parking lot and they, they stand there and they go <laughs> sniff around and then they go, oh yes, pizza and hot dog and candy and soda and all those good things. And I almost always tell them, hey, let's go get a seat and then you can go get something from the snack bar. And then I give them some money to go get a snack. Now, when I give them anything larger than like a $5 bill, there should be some change coming back to me, right? Well, usually there is unless they decide to buy all their buddies a soda and a pizza like one of them did one time at a football game. But when they come back and sit down, I don't ask them for change right away. I want to see what they're going to do. I test them to see if they're going to give me that, pocket, that change out of their pocket or if they're going to give me back what is rightfully mine. And most of the time, they give me the change back. And it's usually right away, but sometimes they give it back and they say, oh man, I really wanted to keep that. And every once in a while, I have to ask them for my change back. Often getting the excuse from them, Oh, oh, uh, I, I forgot. I forgot that I had change in my pocket. But isn't that what we do with God as well? And what God does with us as well? He gives us so much, and then he sits back and waits to see if we're going to give him back what is due to him. And sometimes we do it willingly, and sometimes we do it begrudgingly, and then sometimes he has to remind us to give him what we owe him. Oh, oh, sorry, God, I, I just kind of forgot. You see, we are going to be tested in this life, and God is going to allow that to happen. 
But what we must do is remember that he is with us during those times when we are tested. That he is rooting for us to make the right choice. And that he wants us to come through hard times even stronger, with an even stronger sense of faith and hope in him. You know, when we meet someone with a lot of patience, we often say to them, oh, they have the patience of Job. Now, don't get me wrong, Job was a patient man, but I feel like that sells him very short. Instead of saying he has the patience of Job, I think it would be better to say they have the faith of Job. See, he was a good and pious man that suffered so much that he did not curse God. His faith in God, knowing that God was just, was so great that that is what carried Job through all those difficult things that he faced. So where does this story leave Job in the end? Well, if you've studied Job, you know that it's about 41 and a half chapters of terrible, terrible things befalling Job. And then in the end, the good that comes back to Job for being faithful. God restores what he has taken from Job. He gives him twice what he had before. Job has an additional ten children after all of these things happen to him. He goes on to live to be an old man to see the fourth generation of his family born. Joseph was only given to the third generation. Job was given to the fourth. You see, God was faithful to Job because Job was faithful to God in good and in bad. What does it mean for us, though, all of this? Well, we know that there are going to be good and bad things in this life. And we know that there are going to be times that we will suffer. But even more than that, we have to remember that God is with us through it all. That he wants us to remain faithful to him, even when things are at their worst. And I think the most important lesson we can take away from Job is this. You see, all the bad things that happened to Job, those 41 and a half chapters of bad stuff that happened to him, that was only nine months of his life. Just nine months. And after all of that, he lived 140 years once he was restored. And he saw his family grow, and he lived in great prosperity. So when we think about it, what is nine months compared to 140 years? Truly, it's nothing at all. And as Christians, I want you to think about this. What is a hundred years of pain on this earth compared to eternity in heaven? That's what we need to think about. Even if we lived to be a hundred years old and every single day of our lives was worse than the next one, that is nothing compared to eternity with Jesus in heaven. And that is what we have when we accept Jesus as our Savior. We know that we will have days on this earth that are hard. But we have to remember that we are promised that eternity with Christ. So when you are struggling, I want you to remember that God is with you and there is nothing that can separate us from his love, no matter how bad that situation is. And to remember that there is the promise of eternity in heaven with Christ if you're willing to accept him as your Savior. So my challenge for you this week is this. Do you find yourself being tested by God? And in that test, are you praising him or are you cursing him? Amen.